Entheogens. 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 It's a great topic. It um, haunts the edges of so many other discourses and far too seldom gets a deep dive of its own. Uh, recently, I saw an old interview with Terence McKenna who said psychedelics are anticipatory, preparatory. Well, what he actually said was, it's like we're doing calisthenics, warming up for a marathon at the end of time. And <laughs> what Terence captures there with his usual oddly intonated transrational bardic eschatology is something that many of us have also intuited, that there's a deeply intriguing connection of psychedelics, psychological self-cultivation, and huge transformations in history and culture. Entheogens, in my view, are indeed part of how we prepare ourselves for the predictable peculiarity of the future. Now, it's definitely typical of spiritual teachers, philosophers, and theologians to either denounce drug use or to cautiously minimize its value, saying things like, well, of course, I don't endorse drugs, especially illegal ones, but these substances, if used carefully and infrequently, can, for some people who happen to need that sort of thing, provide a glimpse of the normal stuff that comes automatically to everyone who diligently practices the natural and traditional disciplines of meditation, righteous belief, and institutionally endorsed moral virtues. Now, a lot of people have said stuff like that over the years, and... I've been one of them, a cautious endorser who always makes a point to frame the potential value of these molecules in a broader context of self-developmental practice. Although I technically endorse entheogens as an obvious human right of free citizens and something that can also provide a degree of spiritual clarity and self-knowledge, I do not regularly take advantage of them. Most of my experience was decades ago. I have several rational and several irrational anxieties about going any further in that direction. However, there is a strong argument to be made that this feeling of mine is itself somehow distorted, that my approach is embedded in the general civilizational bias of the last few thousand years, the residual taboo of superstition from a dangerously deviant set of cultures who have dominated this planet and veered away from normal, healthy human existence. That argument recontextualizes the use of psychedelic plants as normal, traditional, and central to human religion and describes their non-use as abnormal, unnatural, self-sabotaging, and frankly creepy. An argument that the great esoteric communities, shamanic lineages, and even regular members of society for the majority of history, especially pre-recorded history, were regular users of these substances with a good conscience as the basis and heart of their religious practice and cultural ceremonies. That these substances are not only entheogenic, not only infusing a version of the divine into our brains and bodies, but also ethnogenic or giving rise to our cultures and civilizations in the first place. That culture itself was originally a spillover from the psychedelic experience of the simian brain and that we must return to this fountain in order to get a fresh new cultural impetus in a world that is seriously shifting under our feet. Now, part of me likes that idea. Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Saturdays, as they say, I am persuaded by this argument and think that the sacred use of mind-expanding plants and their molecular analogs should be radically renormalized as part of an all-out effort to simultaneously get civilization back on track and prepare ourselves for the acceleratingly strange mutations of reality and technology that are coming at us faster and faster and which threaten daily to overcome any number of supposedly reliable truths and methods upon which we practically and emotionally rely. I won't tell you what I think on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, and I'm sure as hell not going to say anything about Sunday. Dear God. What I am going to do, though, is talk freely and wildly and with characteristically hyperlinguistic verve about a couple of interesting ideas concerning entheogens. I don't want to contribute to the kind of sober linear discourse that I'm sure you might get from other wonderful contributors to this series of talks. What I want to do is move 
omnidirectionally across this landscape at a brisk and bouncy, almost acrobatic pace. I plan to do that by recounting versions of three experiences I personally had with entheogens, and in the process sort of tangentially, rapidly, partially, even ironically mix in or scatter around a lot of ideas that I think are most essential in approaching the significance of this topic. I'll tell you the substance, the context, my mindset going in, and some of the temporary effects and lasting insights evoked in me through my participation with these molecules. But I intend to do all of it while speaking in a way that reminds me of the flexible, super-connected enthusiasm of the entheogenic experience itself, and if we're lucky, it might even get you high. Hi. As a final general note before we begin, I'd like to lay out my overall feeling on the topic. It's twofold. Firstly, of course, I believe it's kind of insane and immoral to criminalize traditional natural substances that not only tend to combat trauma and depression, but also open human minds to new scientific, aesthetic, and spiritual possibilities. There's a lot of anxiety and misinformation and demonization from fragile cultural forces that are threatened by anything that opens up people to experience multiple realities. But newsflash, we inhabit multiple realities, and sane, healthy people definitely need to figure out ways of getting better at doing that. Secondly, I feel like there's something weird going on. Emergent peculiarity seems to be building up and haunting human systems. Complexity is building up like the hot water in which the frog sits, and we're the frog, stupidly renormalizing ourselves and ignoring the fact that a huge transition is underway. I think we need to get massively better at handling shocks and surprises, adapting to weirdness, inhabiting the cognitive dissonance between perspectives, and learning to build healthy, functional, meaning-making structures within highly ambiguous information ecosystems that are undergoing unprecedented environmental and technological changes that might overwhelm and paralyze us if we aren't actively working to get better and better at making new sense and new culture fast enough to handle this explosion of new patterns and uncanny juxtapositions. So I believe we can collectively make use of the entheogenic experience in order to help us pre-adapt to the ontologically slippery, vast and puzzlingly patterned reality that everyone from complexity scientists and ecologists to mystics and viewers of the nightly news can sense is emerging like the unfathomable hydra from beneath the turbulent ocean of civilization and history. I took LSD when I was around 19 or 20 going to the University of Victoria. It was the result of finally having access to the university library with the great books of experimental psychology from the 1960s, a time prior to the clumsy reactionary criminalization of psychedelics. And it was also the result of that knowledge blending with youthful daring and my interminable personal research into shamanic intelligence. Although, of course, it was also the first time I knew people who might be able to score me some. So at that point, I'd read all about storming heaven, about Dr. Leary taking a tablespoonful of LSD from a mayonnaise jar his first time, things of that ilk. I was prepared for a real explosion, a real spiritual transformation. I expected to see God with my own eyes and pass utterly through melting walls into the mind-bending carnival of the fifth dimension, or that I would at least encounter my higher self outside of time and form some sort of hypergeometric super loop of consciousness that would know itself equally at all moments of my own life and set itself free in an unthinkable other dimension. That was the mindset. Researchers used to speak in terms of how the experiential content is mediated by three things, set, setting, and dosage. What was the dosage? I took 80 drops that first night, 40 tabs of two drops each. The world might it worried my girlfriend at the time, who had taken a drop or two at a party or two years earlier. But I was convinced I needed vast quantities of rocket fuel to break free of the Earth's gravity. My subconscious fear, I suppose, was perhaps quite justified, and it was that my own degree of mental self-control, my own sheer egotism and concentration of mind, was so powerful, such an iron fortress built up in adolescence, that I needed a seriously potent explosion to break free of my self-grip. 
Now, there's definitely a lot of vanity in imagining how potent your own ego is. And certainly young people tell themselves many lies in order to become daring enough to throw themselves into risky experiences. Nevertheless, I do stand by that choice, and I believe I did need a sufficiently high dosage to ensure that I had no choice but to completely let go of my normal feeling assumptions about reality, self, and control. Still, 40 tabs is a repugnant amount of white paper to consume in a short period of time, and I was also a novice, so I made a classic rookie mistake of haste, thinking the trip isn't coming on yet and therefore taking a little more and then a little more. Well, the very next thing I knew, the next thing that shows up in my memory track was noticing that for some unknown span of minutes, I'd already been perched on the back of the sofa. Trying to get comfortable, perhaps, or trying to open up the Shakti flow, I was rocking forward and back on that couch back, peering with great curiosity at a kind of rhythmic pulsation that was flowing past my consciousness at a distance I couldn't quite estimate. A little sequence of fluxes, either very far away or possibly extremely close. And since I'd read way too many 20th century books on the new physics and the wish-fulfilling power of Asian-infused boomer consciousness, I was understandably primed to assume that I beheld the binary Taoist flux of thought and time, and that some easy, miraculous illumination waited just for me on just the other side, and all I needed was simply to tune my awareness to the gaps between the moments and reveal the transparent background of the power of now being here now. Scrunched up and rocking back and forth on that sofa, I became Hunter Thompson crossed with Deepak Chopra, heir to the freewheeling high promises and easy expectations of post-war Western commercial spirituality. Again, I was about 19 or 20. As I gazed into and then toppled into the moments of the sequence of time and mind. Perhaps I'd merely become aware of the brain's bottom layer of temporal circuitry. You know, it takes a certain amount of objective time for your brain to organize the influx of electromagnetic signals into perceptual data and then to arrange that data in a sequence we experience as the chronological orchestration of perception. It takes a little while. It takes a micro while to begin seeing things happen one thing after another. That's the first layer of the brain clock. And if you deactivate it or look past it for a while, you will then perceive an environment that is not necessarily happening in order, that treats every event as infinite and simultaneous, and maybe only halfway through the process of bundling signals into identifiable impressions. And so what did I see as I gently flew, partially hovered, and fully plummeted into the phenomenological or space on the other side of the subjective flow of time? Well, it was a confusing, sometimes desperate morass that seemed to be boundaried by the toppling domino sequence of the moments of experience. Although I'd passed through, there was still sequential turbulence at the boundary, if that makes sense. The relentless flow of concerned moments of thought and association was still nearby, still chopping up the waters and frothing everything with half-actualized anxiety. I was admittedly a little panicky. I probably wasn't breathing properly for the event. And it didn't help my mood that some giant, floating, obscene, laughing head gazed down at me from somewhere the whole time, looking like a bearded combination of my father and a mid-career Alec Baldwin. Or maybe it was just me. Maybe it was God. But there it was, watching maliciously as I struggled for and against self-control. I did feel I needed to exert some stabilizing mind strength to calm myself down and just get my footing in a bizarre situation. Predictably, though, the mental attempt to exert control produced new concerns and increased chaos. Every desperate move I made to get on top of the situation seemed to be the very thing making the dominoes topple and forcing me to scramble for existential survival. And all the while, the giant ancestor head took perverse delight in my failure. But I persevered and eventually succeeded a tad. I was able to intentionally force freeze the dominoes for brief moments which was enough to start learning the feeling of being balanced in that situation. Somewhere between the attempt to control myself and the realization that these attempts at self-control made the problem worse was a sweet spot, a, a doorway to flow, a feeling of flying by extending the right amount of effort in two opposed directions. The power of balance, <laughs> the doing of non-doing, the updraft of the integration of opposites. And when I saw that several times in a row, then the dominoes just curled gently into their own center and released like melting ice. And what took their place was something out of the Upanishads, 
it was for lack of a better description a cosmic pillar of nuclear fire and hilarity and whose hilarity well mine i guess but it seemed to me then that i was the great laughing head whom i started to believe could possibly be me at a leverage point outside of time was i outside of time that's not only a hard question to answer objectively it might even be impossible to think of being outside of time without actually thinking of being in some kind of time. But at the very least, I felt myself to be up on top of the local time hill with a good omnidirectional view from which I could look down on incoming pasts and outgoing futures in all directions. I seemed to see curious complex pattern resonances spread over all these lines. And the patterns of my present situation seemed to unfold into future and past timelines alike. I was dimly, peripherally aware of other present moments, other time hills in the distance that equally looked down on many futures and pasts. These seemed to be the other peak experiences of my life, those I had already known and those I had yet to encounter but which were somehow inevitable. These moments collectively formed a higher level pattern, a connect the dots puzzle that might reveal the signature shape of my personal existence beyond ordinary time, so to speak. These peaks all seem destined, inevitable, but the valleys between them, which could be traversed in different ways, were up for grabs and prone to chance outcomes. Yet the flavor of the interaction of the hills was me for all time, it seemed. The signature flavor of every version of my birth underneath any culture, language, or set of lived experiences. A stylistic predisposition, possibly genetic, possibly immaterial, but definitely showing forth empoweringly as something quite distinct from the social personhood that my life experiences and education had been cultivating for two decades with the complicity and support of the local civilization. And when you know it, the connect the dots image of this pattern conveniently sketched out the great head that had been hovering above me all this time, and not just a head, I could now see its whole form, a whole body and mood that went along with that hilarified head. It was a super entity, or my higher self, or an energy explosion, but also just a quality, an overtone, an ethos embodied. Entheogen and ethosiogen, and ethnogen. If I changed my angle or lens, I got a different definition of this thing. But it remained delightful, ultimate, devotionally seductive, the pinnacle of value, regardless of which thread I picked out of the immediately available tangle of overlapping interpretations. So as I devotionally pondered this meta pattern of me, it spoke to me and made it clear that I had been summoned or perhaps tricked into this situation, but that I was also a co-conspirator in this plot. The living lord or whoever gave me some half-assed time travel plot in which I was meant to give a message to the virtual me who haunts the void outside of time, and he would then, if then meant anything anymore, inscribe that message from his outside position onto the neural DNA of my brain as I gestated and came to birth. That message, which contained an actionable blueprint of the pattern of myself from beyond time, would then guide me back to this very moment, at which point I would recognize it as my endless ongoing guide and companion and enter consciously into relationship with the delicious meta-self who was the very trans-temporal telos of my born being. And just what was this revelatory self-guiding mystery inscription that was the artist's signature on the painting of my life? the code that would show me to myself and open the pathway to transcendental embodiment, I could hear it circling me, repeating, fluxing. It was the ohm-like murmur of the energy itself, and I'd been hearing it all along. It said, Well, I didn't know what the hell that meant, so I felt more deeply into it, looked more closely at its parts, tried to sense the rhythm more clearly, and that definitely helped. Around then, I noticed my body was making love with my girlfriend, and the rhythms of the coded message might be influenced by the accelerated joyful breathing and love noises, but that was fine. Surely, I thought my experience of love must be patterned by my basic signature of being. And anyway, in her eyes, I saw the self that enfolded us both winking back at me, inviting me onward, calling me to the pinnacle of becoming the eternal beloved in its eternal otherness and selfness. 
So I stayed with the repeating rhythm of the flowing message as it showed itself in more and more nuanced clarity. Now it seemed to say, ah hoo hoo shakas for Mies blower. That was also ridiculous. But I had been a dedicated surrealist since about age 16, so the idiosyncratic absurdity was, for me, just one more enchantment and seduction to keep inspecting. It folded out further, and it started to say, Ah, hoo hoo, Shikastra and Weezblower, Iconosostocles, you are the son of Trimicula, 256418, triangle shotgun keys, thank you, end of message. And the, the triangle shotgun keys were words, but also equally the mathematical therefore symbol in the little triangles made of three dots, wordless minimalist instantiations of the most primitive fact of causal structural intelligibility, the eyes of dynamic pure syntax, the self-presencing of the n-dimensional computational infrastructure of being. Uh, so now I had come to the center of things. Literally all I could see was the face of God who was also me and also my beloved and the world and the opposite of the world. I beheld only the face of God. Unsurprising in a way, since I had laid out that very intention in the mental context of my approach to temporarily placing this psychoactive molecule into my brain receptors. So I stood at the heart of the living cathedral of nature and light and self, but it was also transparently clear that these exotic molecules, with whose cousins the brains of tool-using hominids have symbiotically evolved over the course of history and the prehistory of the noosphere, that these molecules could operate like a lens or microscope that might be pointed in any direction we choose to reveal additional layers and patterns hidden within any aspect of life and mind. I'd simultaneously realized the incredible, useful flexibility of entheogens. And because of the way I had pointed that microscope, I had also discovered some version of the deep transcendental person of the world, who I recognized from having cropped up numerous times in my childhood and magnetized me toward the study of religious history and anomalous events, or maybe I should say the anomalous regimes of events. So yes, you can dialogue with these substances and contextually steer your experience in particular ways or allow a trusted, adequately wise apprentice shaman, for all shamans are endlessly apprentices, to steer your experience for insider healing. Yes, the journey is customizable to some unknown degree, but through it all, beneath it all, between it all, there's something like a mind a great mind. It's, it's like your mind, but also like the mind of all your ancestors. It's like the mind of the biosphere in evolutionary history, rising up like an uncoiling cobra, as they say. It's also like the mind you could become if you were more attuned to more wisdom and more being practice. It's like a universal mind, but it's also intimately personal and uniquely you only, as it is also uniquely only everything else. The Buddha mind of the Zen koans and the godhead of the monotheists and the great ancestor who founded the village at the dawn of time. The always coming, ever emerging trans person who, let's say, winks slyly from the heart of every recognizable form of cognition and perception. The divine person and thing and self and process. I had been truly entheogized. So I had that going for me. And for an eternity of a while until the face of God started to look like an overlay on the room in which my body existed. Kind of a, like a juxtaposed Salvador Dali overlay in which the form of sensory reality without being changed in the exact same shape it is now also looked like the face of the great mind with my own eyes. Two meanings of one shape. Bit by bit, the room interpretation, though, of, of reality started to predominate. I came down. She put on a Guns N' Roses song, I-65, it's called. And I immediately imagined each of the 64 DNA codons having their own sense of self, 64 selves, 64 eyes like the chessboard or a giant box of crayons. And then this 65th eye, this I-65, not just an American highway, but the bonus self, the virtual extra bit of identity that allows you to reconfigure all the others and access a meta self of some kind. I thought all that in like an instant, it seemed, as one thought. But then again, my time sequencing had been suspended and might have been a little rusty. Anyway, I'd never liked Guns N' Roses much. But now this song and all the meanings that spilled over indefinite and coherent and deeply connected and surplus allowed me to take a new imprint. I suddenly loved this band. They were my favorite. Maybe they always had been. They were my destiny. 
with the doors of perception cleansed, so to speak. I took them in like I was learning my first language. You know, in the 60s and 70s, when psychedelic research was legal and computers were new, there was tremendous interest in reprogramming the brain. Lorenz taught ducklings to follow a little golf ball as if it was their mother, and Manson and the CIA and God knows who all else began experimenting with psychedelic brainwashing. Dr. Leary at Harvard, who had initially been dismissed by Aldous Huxley as too square, too professional, too academic, began his mass public science experiments and hypothesized an early model of integrated human development based on chemically activated genetic imprints in the brain. It's very interesting. Dr. Leary not only believed that the burst of neuropeptides at the psychedelic peak was similar to what occurs at birth or in a serious accident, but he also believed the brain takes these imprints or basic snapshots of reality at a deeper level than normal learning and social conditioning. And he said they unfold in a series of evolutionary stages, and each stage characterizes a type of personality within the same human being, but it also characterizes an unfolding sequence of historical, cultural, and technological phases. Sound familiar? Anyway, each of these could be fed or hacked or re-imprinted using different chemical molecules or other practices, right? We can access stages we've already lived through, like our jellyfish brain, our primate monkey brain, our social personality, but we can also access existentially self-aware somatic body brain, a deeper ecological, mythological, and neurogenetic brain system, and even some kind of subatomic intelligence resonating by hitherto unknown information flows into the nervous system through its underlying atomic and molecular constituents. Now, Leary was not an emergentist. He felt we already had all these circuits. He called them circuits because, as I mentioned, it was the 60s and everybody was intimidated by computers back then. He hypothesized that the biosphere is not novel, but rather it's the normal program that DNA runs on every feasible planet it spreads to across the galaxy. Star seed, right? A regular occurrence like the flowers coming up in spring and spreading their seeds in the fall. Just that the blossoming of the flowers looks like the emergence of human civilization and the subsequent seeding takes place among the stars. He was one of the leading alchemists of his day and deserves his place, though not perhaps on the topmost shelf, in the pantheon of my personal legendary heroes. Interestingly enough, my infatuation with Guns N' Roses fell away after a while. Possibly it was not anchored by the ongoing cultivation or reinforcement factors in what they call all four quadrants of our lives. Or, I hope, it turns out there is something more basic and personal about each of us that may have the ability to resist or elude programming an ability supported by experimenting with alternative perspectives and trying to get better at uh, swimming in the emotional waters between our different habits, drives, and psychological functions. I did a lot of traveling after I left the university, and later in life I would tell people uh, that the main thing you get from traveling in other countries is a pleasurable relaxation of the worry that you should be traveling. You no longer poke yourself so rigorously, asking yourself if maybe you should travel before it's too late. And this, this same kind of relief accompanied the experience of the LSD. I no longer wondered if I could dare a huge dose of entheogens. I no longer wondered if my adult self was capable of directly encountering a god or not. I no longer asked myself whether it was possible to seem to convincingly hover outside of time. Those are all interpretations, of course, but the joyful reduction in seeking that comes from having had good, vivid experiences is tremendous and deeply humanizing and deeply emotionally enriching. I'd met the metaprogrammer and now began the really long project of interpreting, reinterpreting, pondering, and trying to articulate this explosion of experience. What I've said about it today might only be a slice of what I went through, but Every attempt to language and to sift through the logic and intertwined sequences of the entheogenic eruption taught my so-called normal brain to be able to think more in those terms, to be able to transfer some of the expanded meta-architecture of reality into the left brain for active discussion, 
logical extrapolation and architectural suggestions about deep reality. Basically, it gave me confidence and a compass. Now, as a result of several implausible coincidences, more akin to French farce than to reality, I ended up in possession of a large bag of Amazonian psilocybin mushrooms. These large, desiccated sex organs of giant transparent mycelial network organisms interested me a great deal because of how prominently they featured in the books True Hallucinations and The Invisible Landscape both of which are lucidly strange records of the high alchemical journeys of Terence and Dennis McKenna in the Amazon in the 70s. I'd read and pondered these archaic volumes in high school long before I had the daring or opportunity to experiment directly in such a fashion. Now, the wild claims of the McKenna brothers were ringing in my ears at this time, like news of a distant UFO landing. They had speculated, bizarrely, using these substances that I now had a bag of, if I remember correctly, that the electron spin resonance of the particles making up the neural DNA could be bonded with psilocybin tryptamines in a percentage of the cells of the brain, making the psychedelic state perpetual rather than temporary. And this could be done by vocalizing the background humming sound present to the brain at the peak of the entheogenic experience. Not really too different than anciently intoning the ohm sound to realize enlightenment, but weaponized now with the verbal armature of leading edge 20th century science. Terence was, by this method, catapulted into an extended psychedelic fugue state, his own personal apocalypse, out of which his evolving theories of fractal time waves and the accelerating convergence of novelty and habit under the watchful gaze of the hyperdimensional object at the end of time and all its uh, language-obsessed legion of jeweled machine elves, where these ideas were seeded into our civilization through him, through that experience. Now, such ideas and the personalities expounding them were enchanting to me, and I... I guess I honored myself enough to risk my life on doing things that I found to be most enchanting. So why not try these Stropharia cubensis mushrooms? Okay, but the bag was quite large and intimidating. I wasn't sure how to proceed. And I mentioned my situation quite casually to some strangers at a party in a, I think a large apartment over top of a newly opened Greek restaurant, smelling of lamb. Well, eager ears at the party pricked up and began immediately propositioning me. So a few days later, I arrive at the entrance to Elk Lake Park, accompanied by a half Samoan and the younger brother of a girl who worked at the high school yearbook project under my improbable directorship. Our collective intent there was to uh, perform the many hour forest walk around the lake and take a few of the friendly fungi. They each consumed a small handful and we began our pretentious ambulation. As we walked, I opined freely concerning my sense of the deep peculiarity involved in finding human neurotransmitters laying around in the bodies of plants. These visionary intelligence activating molecules are so much like the chemicals we use regularly to regulate our moods and perceptions that our brains are willing to install them into critical receptor sites and also know how to flush them out harmlessly. Famously, the ultra psychedelic DMT molecule is actually produced in our own brains. So this weird blurring of plant chemicals and human brains struck me as uncanny and worth probing at the time. Why are the molecules I use to generate reality from incoming electromagnetic noise strewn about the forest floor, growing on trees and hiding in the flowers like mischievous pixies? My two companions simply let me keep talking, urging me on despite what I consider to be the highly speculative nature of my monologue. It's rather strange, I said to them that the substances that I use to imprint impressions of reality are constantly present and exposed in pockets of the biosphere? Doesn't it remind you, I said, of early photography, when people just left chunks of film out, dosed with a particular chemical, and came back later to find it has somehow remembered the shapes of the incoming ambience of light in its environment? What if that's what the entheogens are doing? What if they're like exposed film strips whose chemistry allows them to record impressions of ambient luminosity and information from the environment? 
What if the molecule remembered the secrets of the biosphere and the patterns of the atmosphere and could then communicate that to us when we temporarily place it into the perceptor networks of our brains? Are we downloading intelligence from the bioenergetic information pathways of the ecosystem? Is there some legitimacy to the flakish claim that the entheogens bring us into communication with the guy in mind? And while I held forth on such alchemical topics as would have made Theophrastus Bombastus von Hohenheim chew off his own eyebrows, I was all the time quite absentmindedly snacking on the mushrooms as if they were a bag of addictive potato chips. You know that moment uh, despised by all mindfulness practitioners when you reach for another chip and are surprised to find you've already eaten them all? That was me. Uh, like the walrus and the carpenter, I had eaten them all. And with that sickening realization, the spinning began. So without further notice, my ordinary perception of physical reality became quite ambiguous and definitely not quite the point. Was I physically spinning like a child rushing along the forest pathway and taunting dizziness or was it all in my head? And if so, why was it in my head? Now, of course, I considered the obvious idea that I was simply perceiving the dynamic geometry of the inward and outward flowing toroidal patterns known to be generated bioelectrically in the human chest, which passed through the skull on its endless journey up and down and widening and narrowing circles whose spiral character might make me quite dizzy if I suddenly noticed it overlaid on all perceptions of reality coming into my brain through the senses. Of course, who wouldn't think of that? But I couldn't prove it. For all I knew, it was the imminent quantum plurality of valid solutions to the wave equation, whose treatment as real gives more precise solutions to subatomic questions than any approach based on the idea that there's only one actual outcome. And whether we accept an epistemology in which the many worlds are actual actualities or just actual possibilities embedded in one actuality, we nonetheless have to treat those possibilities as actually actual in order to get the correct numbers and at the same time in addition to that we only ever seem to find ourselves in one actuality so one and many are starting to look like pretty insufficient concepts at this point but what if what seems to be one actual physical reality is actually lots of different realities splitting and blending like waves in the ocean just a little bit beneath our normal evolutionarily adapted neural hallucination based on the minimal number of types of patterns we're born and bred to recognize? Huh? What about that? What if I was simply seeing the real ongoing nature of physical nature, which is a vast interactive panoply that seems like it's spinning endlessly in and out of the world where the primates happen to have evolved? I couldn't rule anything out. But my lived experience was simply one of being swept into a great universal spiraling, which periodically cycled back to my two companions at the lake. Although it was um, subtly different every time, as if I were flipping through a pack of gradually diverging universes. I needed, or imagined that I needed, uh, to figure out what reality I wanted to jump off into. Which world was the most benign and full of great possibilities for a fellow such as myself? Well, I devised what, at the time, seemed like an eminently clever test. Every time I spun into a world where I was standing with two companions at the lake, I would say something suggestive and hilarious. I would say, 21st century temple? And if they responded with obvious and immediate enthusiasm, then this was the reality for me. But if they frowned or evinced skepticism, I would spin out again and try the universe next door. Now, you're probably saying to yourself, Pascal, that is simply a brilliant plan. You are to be commended and probably given free dinner in the town hall for life. But did it work? No, it did not. The, the interworld vortex did not subside, no matter how many smiles I seem to see in response to my assertion about 21st century temples. Perhaps it was only one time that I said that, and it merely looked to me like an indefinite number of slightly varying repetitions. Nonetheless, I began to worry there was no way out. And... Uh, worry can be a mean bastard when your perception of the totality of reality has been rendered largely mood-based. So I swayed sideways into a hellish bardo realm as the psychedelic microscope probed into a sudden wave of unresolved anxiety. Was I trapped? Could I control myself even a little? What was my body doing? How was it being perceived by others at the level of social reality? If my time sequencing mechanism was offline, how could I estimate how long this had been going on for? What if years had gone by? 
What if several sad decades had elapsed with me in a mental hospital after the psychotic break I suffered that day at the lake when I ate way too many, probably poisoned, giant Amazonian mushrooms? I simply never came down. I've been soiling myself and screaming unintelligibly and offensively for years, and the only way they can get me to calm down and stop drooling idiotically for even a short period of time is to get these same two guys to walk me around that same lake. Only a return to the site of the trauma has even a partial effect on my tragically broken mind. I've let everyone down and ruined my life and the lives of others in the most irresponsible and blameworthy possible way. So when anxiety stands out very saliently, that's also the point where it can become very workable. It's clear enough to get your hands around its throat at last. And hell, doesn't it stand out by way of contrast to some background condition that must be non-anxious in order to provide the contrast? Isn't the general background presence of coherent non-anxiety one of those weird euphemisms for the Satchitananda? Something which exists, pervades cognition, and has the co-delight of being both lovable and truthy? Perhaps, I thought, all is not lost. Perhaps I am, in fact, quite near to the Golden Gate after all. Perhaps the Gospels are correct when they proclaim the intrinsic quite nearness that is the kingdom of heaven. Amen, 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 and amen, Ra, and Om, and Hurpar Krat, assuming its risen throne in the East Shambhala. So my mood was rising. But what I saw then was that the so-called Golden Gate background condition was more like a golden worm. Whenever I tried to turn my attention toward it, it wiggled away and suddenly anxiety was front and center again. Steady focus on the coherent anti-anxiety background was itself squirming off to the side each time I tried. I couldn't grasp the golden worm. He slipped back into his hole again and again. Perhaps I thought trying itself is doomed in the face of the ultimate, but that wasn't quite right. I did keep trying and it did start to work. The worm started to look like the kundalini-esque shape of all flow experiences, which I'd only foolishly forgotten for some reason. I stopped trying when it did start working. I was now, in a way, holding the worm and its golden McDonald's fries style radiant pornographic light of surplus value flowed out from and toward me. I wasn't holding it with my hands, but I was holding it with what I might call the balance of my cognition. Like I was focusing stereoscopically rather than half-acidly, with balanced rather than imbalanced brain hemispheres. As long as my consciousness stayed feeling like a dancer reaching in two directions, trying to steady herself on one foot, or you know, somebody trying to spot the hidden pattern of a 3D eye puzzle, then I could hold that worm in place and let the ooze of the righteous juice of divine transfiguration into my soul. I was warming up, coming down, taking off. And what happened then was I was suddenly just completely okay and immediately had full normal perceptual capacity. And the first thing I experienced was then metal bars beneath me. I was on top of a colorful geometrically designed plaything in a children's park near the end of the lake trail. My companions were with me. And the second thing I experienced was enormous concern for them, a melting sensation of remorse. I tried to reassure them and apologize I was sad that I'd ruined their fun drug trip with my wild philosophical excesses and my depressed, anxious, withdrawn brooding upon the universe of unresolved multiplicity and psychosis. They, of course, had no idea what I was talking about. They said to me, you've been laughing nonstop for hours. We've never seen a more delighted being and your happiness was infectious. So one gift of the entheogens is obviously extreme clarity on how far apart the inner and outer tracks of experience can really get. Later that night, I ate a jalapeno-flavored potato chip for the first time, and then I ate them compulsively for weeks. But eventually, both the bliss and the jalapeno chips fell away into unsupported renormalization. <laughs>
She suggested I lie down, but I'm glad I stayed sitting upright until the initial abdominal ambiguity subsided. I had been expecting a significant ordeal. Mm, serpents, bloodthirsty jaguars vomiting indigo secrets while I spilled my guts in the muck outside the hut. I've been imagining that such barely tolerable sessions were going to be morally guided by an intellectually suspicious official shaman from some supposedly ancient tribe or else from some self-serving weekend neo-shaman certification course. And I tended to consider being official, being affirmed by a tribe or validated by a certificate as a sign of something deeply suspicious like a bank with the word trust outside in big gold letters. Makes you wonder why they want you to believe it. But anyway, this woman was wonderful, an actual shamaness, someone who has spent their actual whole life studying the interplay between their intuition and the ecosystem, learning to find the gap between health habits and tribal habits, delving into the imaginal proprioceptive worlds of healing and revelatory flow states, as a seeker of sacred sites, a consecrator of objects, an improviser of rituals, um, a ponderer in the deep, shapeshifter, invoker of quasi-real entities, experimenter with ordeals, a real shamanist, not an official shamanist. Sometimes those two categories overlap, but often they do not. She, anyway, lent me the confidence that my whole being would be held in the right context and this was important because it had been more than a decade since I dared any entheogens. She put on two different kinds of ambient jungle and flute music on two different laptops, gently explored her own drumming, and sat vigil over me as I closed my eyes and lay back into the earthly grave of the mother vine. And it was anything but an ordeal. Perhaps the ayahuasca goddess was on best behavior. It was our first date, after all, and maybe she wanted to seem accommodating, seductive, brilliant, and delightful. And who knows what bitchy outbursts and half-strategic misinterpretations might gush forth on a third date as she gets more comfortable and less ingratiating. Anyway, I had a most delightful time. It began rather innocently as a play of tryptamine imagery on the dark screen behind my eyelids. Having smoked DMT once before, thanks to an unspecified member of the integral intellectual community, I was familiar with the kinds of smooth technicolor scenarios provided by tryptamines. Basically, hypnagogic imagery, but without being on the verge of sleep and maybe with a little more neon technicolor. Uh, you know that moment when your daily or spontaneous meditation progresses to the point where instead of holding on or letting go, you suddenly lift up, expand, and see a god, a goddess, or shifting array of gods and goddesses, heavenly thrones, erotic machinery, and abstract information flux on the imaginal screen behind your eyes. You know that moment when the, when the apex astral image comes alive, where this moving, pulsating shape of the energy insight thing itself is passing through its own divine membrane like a starship coming out of the star dock and then opens into the slow rhythmic humming space where it folds back into its original position without ever having moved but being perpetual motion itself at the apex and heart of all being. Ever see that? I call that beholding Bhagavan, and mysteriously, I can't be bothered to try to do it a lot, but that's the kind of imagery that DMT produces in lower doses, which is to say... Uh, doses at which you still know what the phrase the back of my eyes even means. And I mention this because DMT is in ayahuasca. You probably know the sludge is made from two different plants, a DMT shrub and a vine. DMT normally breaks down in your stomach unless you concern a special chemical that non-harmfully temporarily deactivates the AMO enzymes that do the breaking down. Now, how did ancient shamans know to pull off this feat of amazing combinatory jungle psychopharmacology? Well, they say the plant spirits told them, and while I deeply suspect they are ignorant of their own history, which may well not have been in the jungle, but in many million man nations living in sophisticated cities across what is now the Amazon, I nevertheless do credit the notion of human plant dialogue. Why not? If you spend a lifetime watching, feeling, sniffing, tasting plants in your territory and trying to think about them in nonlinear fashion, you probably get a pretty awesome subconscious right-brained ability to randomly utilize parts of those plants with extraordinary effect when prompted to. So I lay there informed by these thoughts about how one plant affects my stomach enzymes and one provides the DMT images. 
And that's when they started chiding me for this naive assumption, insisting that the other plant does a hell of a lot more and contains a vast complexity of power and intelligence that I had not hitherto appreciated. I say they because although I do get the feminine healer intelligence thing about Mother Ayahuasca, nonetheless, the actual influx of information to me seemed to be from the you know, the ambiguous celestial host of the indefinite transmaterial many ones, closer to the mischievous angels, aliens, and elves than they are to any particular spirit or deity. They started to tell me that the flavor of this particular entheogen experience was not based on the context of my assumptions, nor on the structural complexity of the plants themselves, but also upon many thousands of years of shamans and explorers leaving their psychic imprint or somehow steering the experience toward a particular range of cosmically remembered morphologies. Regardless of whatever we might personally think about that old wag, Rupert Sheldrake, they were claiming that the benevolent healing qualities of ayahuasca were impressed upon it by the will of many generations of um, a super potent ur shamans at the dawn of history with their prodigious capacity to exert intention. The claim, it seemed, was that these existentially more intense ancient people, pyramid builders and calendar creators and the writers of the alphabet itself, you know the type, these people who invented yoga and religion a thousand years before the first recorded examples, that they had a real edge in terms of predisposing futures. Those men and women, maybe we could say real men and women, were special because they could create this ridiculous degree of correspondence between their deep intentionality and the outcomes of the world. Or so the elves kept murmuring to me. They, these elves, made of pure syntax, the voices of language itself, the symphony of biology's insides, they were trying to make it clear that those ancient people had been able to impress their vibe onto the molecule over long periods of time to make it specifically a wise and healing plant. And they could do this because they developed themselves in a certain way. What way? Well, they told me this capacity had been developed through mostly subconscious or accidental practice of willing the indefinite extension of experience and action. That these ancient people had practiced thinking, moving, and feeling as if there were an infinite extension of their every act. Sacred posture, flowing motions, holy objects, affirmative existential stances in both the metaphoric and physical sense grow to the next level of imprinting reality by intending the forever of your perceptions and deeds. This, the potential entities told me cheerfully, was what Nietzsche was or should have been hinting at with his admonition to test ourselves by willing the eternal recurrence. Well, of course I couldn't entirely trust these transplural syntactical elves who may well have been just my own proto-thoughts emerging and self-organizing while being viewed by me at 10,000 times magnification. Or hell, maybe they were disembodied entities from an actual other realm. Or maybe those are two equally valid interpretations of the same ontological machinery. But nevertheless, I love secret internal techniques, so I resolved to start practicing their method forthwith. I won't tell you what the invisible ayahuascan parliament said also about elections or about the basic philosophical mistakes of the last star wars trilogy needless to say they're laser focused on depth vitality bounciness vibrancy and moral coherence in the face of an emerging slow rolling meta crisis of vast and deeply weird events and they want our help in fighting this battle on another level altogether apparently only you can prevent fires in the forest of meaning So obviously I'm quite fascinated by this incandescent intersection between time, intention, psychedelics, and the protean plurality hidden within the ancient neurobotanical mysteries of the plant world. I would recommend entheogens under the right conditions for anyone who is interested, 
their healing and revealing properties are simply staggering. Although I've had an extremely minimal relationship for many years, I have no compunctional mm, issue about advocating them, with the caveat that suggesting people go for a drive implies safe driving for yourself and others. The proper mindset and some intelligence about where you're going, that's a given. But on the other hand, I don't want to be too far into the camp of people who think these things should only be used cautiously within the context of spiritual healing groups and university labs. I think there has to be a dynamic interplay between individual and group contexts of experience, between wild and domesticated psychedelic use. Experimentation, daring, um, odd alternative impressions of normal personal and collective life, these things are culturally important. It doesn't mean we all need to be Hunter Thompson with a head full of acid on the White House reporter's jet plane, but neither do we all always need to be very careful to have the experience framed for us by groups, religions, traditions, and the other representatives of ancient or higher wisdom. If I'm looking at this in terms of how we prepare our neurophysiological souls for deep growth, uh, for deep ecological insight, and for massive technocultural weirdness, then I think we absolutely need both free-range chaos and responsible orderly contexts to uh, cross-pollinate each other. We have to use whatever tools are possible in order to make ourselves interperspectively coherent, transcendentally good-humored, ontologically anti-fragile, and more deeply human, to make ourselves uh, better learners, more able to access subconscious, collective, computational, organic, and transcendental intelligence, all of which means faster, more adaptable brains that can figure out more gracefully what they need in order to keep it together on the other side of meaning. Is there an other side of meaning? Are things actually getting weirder out there and in here? Objectively, it's undetermined. Instinctively, I tend to agree with the entheogenic lore of the imminent apocalypse of strangeness that is hidden in the secret depths of every moment and slowly or not so slowly accumulating now as our new historical and cultural reality. You probably know, I used to have these dreams for years, maybe some nights when I'd awaken during the regular nocturnal DMT spike in our circadian rhythm. These dreams where I was wandering across a familiar, safe, but uncanny landscape in the dark. And somehow I knew it was my birthday and I would notice odd coincidences stacking up like how strange it was. I hadn't realized all my life that my birthday was also on Christmas morning and that the second coming of Christ had occurred very recently, and the world was full of people rejoicing or blowing their minds or both, that that's probably why they didn't notice this was also the night the aliens landed openly, and the enchanting ethereal lights of their improbable crafts blended emotionally into all the lights on all the Christmas trees, and the sly, ambiguous bear spirits flowed in long, streaming rows across the surface of the world, and I started to levitate and glow and rose up into the high branches of the old ash tree that grew in the field outside the house where I was born, and why had I never noticed that this was the very world ash spoken of in the high shamanic trances of the Vikings? You ever get a feeling like that? I had these dreams a lot for a while. It, it's a kind of heaven. It's a, it's a real class of possible feeling outcomes. A hyper novel, super vivid, magical realm-like state of perception, which is in a way the friendly upgrade from the trap of epistemological contradiction, from the trap of our hypersemantic environments, widespread ontological vexation, the information apocalypse, the pandemic death of meaning and the return of everything, the fact you literally cannot treat audio and video recordings or photographs or news stories or government agencies or university experts as being necessarily valid anymore or maybe ever. That's the world, this world right now. So imagine the crystallized embodiment of all that and its mysterious solution are hovering just a fraction of an inch to the left of your current molecular style of perception. What is that? Has anyone else seen it? 
contemplative and psychedelic mystics have been reporting this kind of stuff for a long time, but we've either been too dismissive, too formulaic, or too dedicated to renormalization to really grapple with the the vast intelligent whales that dwell below the surface of these nearby oceans. Full disclosure, obviously, my instincts lean in the direction of believing that the the iceberg of ultra peculiarity is coming toward us. Well, we argue about whether our philosophies will lead to instability or stability. There's a kind of upgrade to radical flex stability needed at all levels of society, mind, and body, which is perhaps the minimum necessary preparation for the waves of disruptive context erasing strangeness that have already entered our atmosphere from out of hyperspace so to speak you know just as that great ship the titanic crashed into the iceberg of modernity itself spilling its mass cargo of internationalism automated labor narrow individualism and and the exaggerated contrast between the rich and the poor the consensus and the naive so too is post-modernity the ship of pluralistic many worlds and ecologically symbiotically contextually aware structural consciousness racing toward its own iceberg the great glittering stone or lightning vajra diamond of excess organized novelty and technicolor simplexity and unresolvable ontological peculiarity a positive or negative kali yuga seems to be awakening and it demands a more rapid process of inner and outer upgrades um, than our current habit of knowledge, political organizations, and perceptions themselves afford us. At the edge of my meditations, in the heart of the few deep entheogenic immersions that I've had, is this beautiful and ominous bifurcation in the history of our sense-making that seems to be slowly lowering itself toward us like a gigantic UFO descending upon the civilization, maybe still half concealed behind the clouds, but only half, to adapt or even to become anti-fragile to this unfolding earthquake of repatterning requires both Buddhism and its opposite, both Christ and Satan, both science and the poetic emotions working together at the edge of chaos a time of miracles and catastrophes in increasing frequency, which, as William Gibson said of the future, it's already here, just unevenly distributed. Entheogens are, are one way to access the future that is already here. Entheogens are places where the concentration of the future is higher than the normal level at the moment. But make no mistake, the overall sea level is rising. In the opinion of the intelligences that have typically revealed themselves to me within the psychedelic continuum, we are soon going to be in a place where AI, Donald Trump, and pandemics are quaint and nostalgic. How are you going to feel when the first eugenic cyborg octopus is elected president of those United States and then outs himself as a transsexual flat earther committed to Zoroastrianism? Right? I'm not talking about that specific event. I'm talking about that specific feeling. It's coming more and more, and it can skew toward flex stability, organic health, and full-spectrum bounciness, or it can skew into nightmare. Either way, things are going to get weirder, according to the elves, <laughs> but of course, that's what elves would say, you know? Still, it would be nice to think we are getting better at occupying the kinds of patterns of reality that have traditionally been excluded from human consciousness in favor of our overly simple geometries, our modest politics, and our dull or even evil pseudo-religions. We confront a universe of organized but incomprehensible complexity that must be heuristically worked with and courageously explored at the limit of knowing as it streams outward and inward from the present moment in all directions like the limitless digits of pi. There are tentacles of light and wisdom in parts of our mind that don't talk with us directly and tools that tell us about things we've never imagined or which are part of the substance of imagination itself. There is a great force of the weird coming. It's already showing up. It's not going away. It's not returning to normal. 
it's not trucking along just fine in the right direction. It's only going backwards or forwards more and more quickly. The truck is gaining speed as it careens down the hill. And trying to implement the same rate of progress you used last year is going to get us all killed. We need to do better, faster, inside and out, personally and socioeconomically, and entheogens can be a potent ally for the billion new shops we need.